Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter, along with Sarah. Hello. And we are bringing you our weekly live stream. There was a little confusion because I posted a video this morning of making the background of this. Uh, so some people were a little worried that there wouldn't be a live stream, but uh, but don't worry. As long as I'm in town, we do a Friday live stream. <laughs> Uh, so if you want to know how I did the background, because we're going to be painting on this, I have a video. I think I linked it up in the video description, but it's the, the most recent one on my channel, if not, and you can also get to it on my blog. Um, you can paint right on a plain canvas. You don't have to do this work here, but I think it, um, it just looks kind of nice. And I used acrylics for this. So when you do your background in acrylics, you can go right over and paint with it with oils or acrylics. If you're using acrylics today, that's totally great. Um, you might want a little slow drying medium to kind of just keep your open time of the paints longer so they behave a little bit more like oils. Um, if you're using regular oils, that's great too. I'm using Berlin water mixable oils and you can find these at Jerry's Artorama. I have a coupon code in the video description. One of the reasons I wanted to use these today is that they have their regular, I think like $33 a set of 10 and they're on sale for $19.99 today. I think it's the last day of their 49th anniversary sale. So I just wanted to kind of give these a demo. That way if anybody was curious, they can, you know, try out a brand that's a really good price right now. I'm going to use a variety of brushes. Um, I'm going to use these uh, black swans. Now, hopefully, it doesn't look like I'm going to poke you in the eye with these because they're a long-handled brush. You typically would paint with long-handled brushes at the easel, and I typically would paint it at an easel if I wasn't recording. Um, but you can, I think they come in short or long handle, but they are a synthetic red squirrel brush and they're, they're uh, firm enough to push oil paint around, but they're soft enough to get some nice blends. So, um, so those are, those are really nice. If you're looking for uh, something to supplement your hog bristle brushes, because the hog bristle brushes are just kind of scratchy. They're great for sketching and for putting loads of color down, but they can get a little scratchy otherwise. If you have any questions, type the word question in the um, chat and type it in all caps so Sarah can see it and she will relay any questions to me. Try to keep it to the topic of oil painting since that's what we're doing today. Or, or if you're asking how to do something with like acrylics, you know, if you're, if you're painting with acrylics and you have a question, how would you do this instead with acrylics? That's fine too. Just keep it on topic to this painting so it will be helpful to the people watching in the replay. Did I, did I get everything, do you think? I think so. Okay. If not, we've got all of our, we've got a bunch of lovely moderators who will help keep it yes. all together. Yes, our moderators are the best and they know, they know just about everything. So. They do. Uh, so since these are water mixable oils, I am using uh, a little water to thin down some white paint so I can sketch. We're going to sketch directly on here. Um, if you're using traditional oils, use a little turpentine, gamsol, mineral spirits, whatever you like to use for a solvent. Now I kind of, I, I stenciled this just background on, I wanted just a little texture and color and I kind of want a, a large flower on here and I want kind of like a branch maybe coming over. So I have put a couple of reference photos linked up in the video description um, so that you can kind of get an idea of what a magnolia looks like. I am just going to kind of sketch in where I want um, a branch to come from. And you're not really going to see this composition on any of the reference photos, but you can look and see what the, the buds and the blooms look like on a magnolia. I want to get the big flower uh, painted in or, or just outlined uh, as quickly as I can so that I don't, um, so that I can kind of reserve that space and then I can put some other things around it. So I'm starting just by uh, very loosely kind of sketching in an oval. And I'm just using thin down white paint for this. If you're using acrylics, you can add a little bit of water to your acrylics, do the same thing. And if you make a mistake, you can take a, a tissue or a Q-tip with some water if you're using water mixables or acrylics or with some turpentine and you can wipe out your mistake. So don't worry about getting it perfect. It's a lot more forgiving than even a pencil. Uh, D. Walker, are there any other advantages to water mixable oils besides the fact that you can clean up with water? I think that's the main one. They dry about the same as uh, traditional oils as far as time goes. Um, I like not having to have solvents open since I have children uh, around, but um, but that's really the only, the only big advantage. They might be a little less expensive than traditional oils, but, you know, I think it just depends on who, which ones you're buying. Some will be more expensive and some will be less. I'm just sketching in some petals here. We'll refine everything more when we get in with our color. 
Taylor Young, did you prime your painting surface with anything? Um, I took a, a regular primed canvas and I um, sponged and sponged on some acrylic paint and I collaged on some mulberry paper and did some stenciling. And that tutorial is in the video description linked up uh, right on my channel. I posted it this morning. So I figured some people would have some questions on how I did that. Uh, Gracie Shack, what oils would you recommend for a beginner? These are really nice because you can um, you can clean them up with water, so it takes that variable of dealing with solvents out. But um, you know, whatever whatever you can get a hold of. Oil painting there's not there's not doesn't seem to be that much difference in quality with oil paints as like watercolors. It seems. Let me get a little leaf tucked in there. I really like the way magnolia buds look, so I want to get one of those in here. I might put it off its own branch, though. I feel like I want maybe it coming up on its own branch. And that's kind of just like a um, kind of a tall, pointy, triangly shape. And I'm not going to do any leaves right now because. Um, We'll paint those in where we feel like they need them. All right, now with oil paints, a lot of times your white is your strongest color. So after sketching in, I really don't like to use that much white until um, I've gotten my other colors in so they don't overcome everything. And I'm just, I'm going to start with a hog brush, a bristle brush, because I'm putting color in. And I've got some alizarin crimson here. I'm going to take a little bit of ultramarine to that. It's going to make kind of like a plum color. I'm going to add that. Um, I think I'm going to start in with this petal here over on the side. Just to get that down in the shadow area. The thing I love about oil paints are how rich they are, and since they're so slow drying, they're really fun to use. Uh, the Almuts, how do I make the liquid white Bob Ross uses in his videos with water mixables? Just titanium white plus linseed oil, or can I use water to make it more liquid? I'm really not familiar with the liquid white that, by Bob Ross, so I'm not sure. If it's like an oily, um, consistency then yeah I would use I would use linseed oil but if it's um if it's more thin I would probably just use water on a water mixable but maybe somebody that's used the liquid white uh could respond in chat If you, and if you try water mixables and you decide that you don't really like them that much, you prefer your regular oils, you can use them with regular oils. They'll they don't they'll just won't be water mixable anymore. They'll take on the characteristics of the of the other oils. Uh, Paige Keen, did you wet your brush before starting to paint with color? No, no, I just went dry into the uh, into the paint. I'm just trying to put in the uh, richer and darker and shadowed areas of my flower. I don't want to cover everything up because I don't want to lose my design. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and grab some white. I'm not going to clean my brush off. Um, like I said, white is a very uh, strong color. So that will kind of help temper it a little bit. And now I'm going to I'm going to kind of look at the petals um, a little further towards the back of the flower and get them painted in first because um, putting brighter white highlights on the ones in front are going to make them stand out a little bit more. And I'm still in the blocking in stage, so I'm not going to worry about um, getting anything perfect. I just want to kind of fill in the areas that I want to fill in. I am leaving the front petals 
unpainted. I'm not just going to paint it and then add on top like you might with acrylics, just because that paint is going to stay wet. And then I might have a hard time to, um, to, you know, get any colors to show up on top of it. I don't know if you guys remember when we did the macaroons, we used these paints and I had a hard time getting the shadows because the wet paint underneath that lighter color, because they were all pastel macaroons, they wanted to like overcome what I had for my other colors that I was trying to add for my shadows. Probably looks like I'm poking people in the eyeballs with the handle of that brush. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's like they're really here with you. I know. Why are you poking me in the face, Lindsay? What did I do? I got glasses on. Poke away. <laughs> oh, chewy. She needs a belly rub. And we will mute down some of the colors for these shadows, but I don't want to do that yet because I don't want to have a muddy flower. And um, you can always mute things down, but you can't. it can be difficult to brighten them back up when, because you have all this wet paint. So that's why I'm not adding in any yellow ochre or any um, burnt umber or anything. Oh, the colors I'm using on my palette. I didn't, I'll put these in the video description later. Um, I've got phthalo green, lemon yellow, uh, yellow ochre, alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, burnt umber, and white. Uh, Eve's bolts. Can the oil in oil paints ever go rancid? Usually not because they, the oil they use is linseed and that doesn't spoil like a vegetable oil will. Um, I have some M. Graham oils and they're lovely. They use walnut oil, so perhaps those could go rancid, although I have never had that happen. And I don't know if it would really affect anything if it did go rancid. It's not like you're eating it. I don't I don't know if it would like like make it act funny or anything. Now, I tried to get my edges nice as I'm doing this. I tried to kind of like wiggle into my edges a little bit so I get a nice crisp edge so that way I don't have to do any cleanup. Uh, Sarah Gear, do you ever use acrylic paint and do you use any additive to make them blend like oils? Um, when I use acrylic paint, I'm usually using them for uh, craft projects. I don't tend to paint with acrylics very often. Um, if I do, it's usually to like do a base layer so I can go over it with something else. Um, if I was going to do a painting with acrylics, I probably would use some mediums to help them stay wet longer since I prefer to paint that way. Uh, Deborah Aceta, do you have to let the oils dry in between layers? It depends on the technique that you're doing. Um, we're doing an alla prima technique today, which means uh, literally it means painting all at once. So we don't need to let it dry. As you're, if you're painting something though, like maybe a portrait where you want to add a lot of layers for like skin tones, you would want to um, let layers dry or at least set up a bit. And then every layer you put down, it's very important that each layer on top, it has more oil in it than the previous layer because um, those, they may feel dry to the touch, but those bottom layers are not in fact dry and they could still shift. And if you have a, um, a solvent heavy layer, those dry faster. If you have those on top, they're going to dry quicker. And the ones underneath are still movable and, um, and wet and they, they will crack. You'll get that the crazing on your painting. So if you are going to do layers, you just need to make sure you have more oil added to your paints as you progress. Jelly Belly 11, what gesso do you use? Um, I usually, I buy pre-primed um, canvases for the most part. Um, I have used a bunch of different brands. I've used Liquitex. I like the Jerry's Artorama one too, because it's really thick and it's very inexpensive. I've used Pro Art, but with the Pro Art, I had to um, leave the cover off and let, like, um, let some water evaporate out of it because it was so... Uh, watery. Um, I actually ended up letting it settle and then I dumped off a bunch of water from the top because it was so just so watery and runny and I didn't really like it that much. But yeah, I don't, I don't think Gesso is one of those products that is really that different between brands and I really don't think it's that. I don't know. It's, it's imp I don't think it's important to buy a really expensive Gesso. But I usually just go with what's on my canvas unless I need to prime like a masonite board or um, priming raw canvas or something. Uh, Baru Siva, 
Will you be using black swan brushes in this painting? I'm thinking of buying them for water mixable oils. Yes, I am. I'll be using them on the uh, the later layers because they are really great for blending. Um, when I'm putting down a lot of color and mushing it around, I want to use a more robust brush that I'm not going to, like if I look at the, like this, they're so soft. So they're much better for like blending. They're firmer than a watercolor brush, but they're they're much softer than the hog brush brushes here. I'd be curious to know if anybody in the chat has tried the Mimic Hog brushes. I haven't used those yet, but they're on my wish list. It's hard to justify buying more brushes because I have so many. <laughs> Holy moly. Okay, remember when you're get if you want to get those nice sharp edges, just kind of tip your just kind of Go at it at an angle, go after that edge, and just kind of wiggle, and you can kind of push that ridge of paint out in a nice smooth fashion. And don't be shy, turn your turn your canvas. If you're painting at an easel, you might want to have like um like a stick with like uh, what I do is I take like an old drumstick and I put um, some cotton balls on the end and put a piece of fabric and put a rubber band around it so I can actually rest that stick on my canvas and I can rest my hand against it so I can get those nice. Um, smooth straight lines without you know getting a you know if my hands are feeling shaky or whatever okay so now i want to get the branches in before i get too far and i'm going to use i like to use a flat brush when i'm using oh like any sort of thick paint like this and i'm going to grab the burnt umber i'm going to add a little bit of water to it so you solve it if you're using a traditional and I'm just going to kind of sketch in first with this color. Oh, I just realized I missed. Oh, no, that's a leaf. I forget. I'm going through for a couple different um, reference photos. So I'm kind of looking around, deciding what I want to use from each thing. Uh, Alex, Sarah, I found a wooden box full of old, old vintage oil paints. Some are Grumbacher and some a brand I don't know and can't find any information on. And some medium of some kind, are they? Are these safe to use? If they're still, um, you know, if they're still wet, yeah, go right ahead. Nothing's going to happen to them. If it would have happened to them if they're, if they're, oil paints last a long time. They're, you know, quite, um, quite affordable in that respect that, they, they last a lot long, longer than acrylics in storage and they put up with a lot more um, uh, harsh conditions that acrylics won't do well with. All right, now I'm going to add a little, I'm not even going to clean my brush, I'm going to grab a little yellow ochre, a little phthalo green, makes a pretty color. This will be our highlight on our branches. I'm just kind of dabbing them on so I get a little texture. And it helps it feel a little more round too when we do this on one edge of our painting. Oh, by the way, my palette is simply a plate from the Dollar Tree. Um, I like these white squarish plates because you get a lot more space than with a round one. But if you have an old round white plate, it works great. I find that I can... Um, really clean these well even scrape them off if the paint dries although you're better off just to take a spray it with water and wipe it off when you're done but um it's a wonderful surface because unlike palette paper sometimes you're using palette paper and like it wants to lift up on you or slide around on you this is nice and heavy and it's not going to go anywhere so i really like that all right so we've got this leaf here uh since i've got this pretty dark mix i'm gonna grab a little more green maybe a little bit of crimson with that make a nice dark color here and that's going to go inside here into the the, the leaf is kind of like cupped around it's like a cupped shape like that so on the inside here i'm going to go in with that color i'm going to be careful not to get into my flower so i'm just kind of wiggling up to the edge and keeping that line crisp ainsley koch 
Even when I use oils, regular water soluble, I feel like I lose detail as I continue to paint. How can I blend the colors without losing detail or lines? Um, I would recommend that you maybe let it dry and then go in with a smaller brush with linseed oil added to your paint or the water mixable equivalent um, of mediums and then just go in and add your details at that point because if you're just putting a little bit of paint with vehicle like linseed oil you can get much crisper um much crisper results all right so now for the major leaf color i am going to uh, rinse off my brush and i use the same bucket that i would use for all other paints when i'm washing my brushes but you could keep a separate one if you were afraid it might contaminate things i really don't think it would but so I'm going to take some yellow ochre and some phthalo green. A little more yellow ochre there. And I'm going to fill in the rest of this leaf. Okay, so let's see. I think I've got only oh, want to put a little bit of a green um, waste on this bud. So I'm going to take some of this lemony yellow. I'm just going to double check the name of this in case you're. It's called primary yellow. It looks more like a lemon. It looks like a lemon to me. So you could use any sort of cool yellow you want. And I'm going to make the little waste area. Another tip is I put a couple dabs of, of white down instead of one big dab when I'm putting out my colors that way. Um, if one gets contaminated, I haven't wasted all of my white. Or I might use one for when I'm mixing, you know, warm colors and one when I'm mixing cool colors. Just to keep it, um, keep it a little bit less waste, I guess. Katrina Noel, what is a good substitute for phthalo green? Uh, Viridian or Emerald. It, people, different, com different companies call it different things too, so. Kind of keep that in mind okay so now i think i want to think about maybe a few other i think i want to put another leaf in there actually before i get too far uh, i'm going to go ahead and just put uh, i think i'll put one right here I'm just sketching it in with that dark color that I had. Maybe another little one right next door. And that heavier color is going to help ground the, um, the picture because I have so much stuff up high. I want to have a few things down low to help ground things. Maybe another one over here. I think it's easier for whatever reason to put in the darks and then add the highlights onto it. So I'm just gonna fill these right in. This is a mix of phthalo and yellow ochre. So in a few days, if you're looking at your painting and you decide you'd like to add some more, but the paint started to dry, just add um, linseed oil or whatever oil you have. Oh, oh, there we go. oh did Video we have a problem? Just blacked out for a second, but it came right back. Oh, okay, good. So uh, you could add, if you if you wanted to do more detail down the road, just make sure that you add some oil to your paint. Like I, I usually use linseed oil. I don't have any um, water mixable medium, so I just use my regular oil ones. And then I just have to clean those brushes with uh, appropriate solvent. I just keep a, like an old spaghetti sauce jar with some mineral spirits in it and I have a piece of aluminum screening in the bottom so when I clean my brushes all the sediment falls under the screen and it keeps the stuff pretty clean so I don't have to change it very often because that's a hard thing trying to figure out what to do with the solvents that you've used like how to dispose of them uh, Kendall Macaulay which colors would you use to make a peach I would use crimson and lemon and mix those up. Okay, 
Okay. So now I'm going to switch over to my black swans because they're much softer. I really like filberts. Um, I find that when, when you're dealing with a viscous paint like this, having something with a soft rounded tip um, just gives you a much more gentle stroke and you can get nice detail because you can kind of wiggle right in with that curved edge. And um, having a flat ferrule, it pushes the paint around a little bit better versus with watercolor, having that round ferrule with tons of uh, bristles in there hold so much paint and water so that's not really what you want with your um, heavier body mediums you want something that's going to control and kind of push things around a little bit so filberts are great because you get that soft rounded edge but you have the flat ferrule and the stiffer bristles that help you uh, move things around so I'm going to make kind of a warm highlight color I'm going to grab a little yellow ochre and I think I'm going to take um, maybe just a smidgen of the primary yellow, which is like a lemon. And I'm going to grab some white. Uh, Katrina Noel, what is the difference between water-soluble oil and acrylic? Um, this is still an oil paint. It's going to dry slow and, and behave just as any oil paint, where acrylic is a, like a plastic. It's an acrylic emulsion, and it goes through a chemical change when it dries. It's just a different... A completely different type of paint. So now I am going to start adding kind of like highlights with this color here. And I think I'll start with this front petal. So I'm going to wiggle it up to the edge. And because my bristles are softer than what I painted with originally, uh, it shouldn't disturb what's underneath as much as like if I went in with a, um, a stiffer brush. And I like that I can just very gently throw in some little warmth and highlight and just blend so nicely without disturbing too much of what's already there. Uh, Jennifer Hopping, once the paint dries on the palette, will it reconstitute well with water? No, nope. once it's dried, it's permanent. Uh, Gina Har Harbord, uh, do these water soluble oils, whoops, Chat bumped up. Water soluble oils dry more quickly than regular oils. No, they're about the same. The quickest drying oil paint I've ever used is the um, Lucas 1862. That will dry to the touch in about 24 hours. Ian Jackson, do you feel that water soluble oil paintings have a longer or shorter ugly phase? Uh, <laughs> I think it all depends on the artist. It depends on what you're painting. Um, I don't think it, that really matters. My hot mess phase can can appear anywhere from like halfway through the painting to all, through, the, way all the way through the painting. Perfect from start <laughs> to finish. Yeah, I don't pull that off too often, unfortunately. <laughs> It's like decluttering your house. You have to get that. You have to get. You have to make a mess before you get it clean. You know. I mean, that's kind of. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how, how painting is, I think. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I want to put a little bit of a cast highlight on the edge of this petal here because there's some light being reflected off the bottom of that petal. So I just want to get a little slice. I'm going to rest my elbow on the table, actually, because um, I... I feel like I don't have a very steady hand right now. There, that's all I wanted in there. Too much coffee today? Well, not really. I'm actually still finishing up my morning coffee. I've got this like three hour stale coffee yeah. sitting on my, yeah. well, it hasn't been on the on the pot that, and it's been in my cup that whole time, but. but it's cold. Yeah, it is. Uh, Nicole Johnson, do these types of paintings turn if they get too much sun exposure as quickly as watercolors? No, they're much more durable because they have a nice um, medium that they're encased in, whereas watercolor is encased in a very fragile medium, gum arabic. This is encased in oil, so it's got a, like every little coat, every little granule of pigment has a nice, like, um, cushy coating on it. So you're much more, that's why they'll use some pigments in oil paints and acrylic paints that they won't use in watercolors just because they're the pigments are too volatile when you've got when you don't have, when you have them so exposed it's like you wouldn't go to a you know you wouldn't go outside to go hiking in a silk shirt because you'd get it torn or it get you know wet and you, you could ruin it it's the same thing with water like watercolor certain pigments can't hold up to watercolor now 
when you frame an oil painting, you're you are not supposed to encase it in glass, correct? Just a good quality frame. Right. Okay. Yep. It can it can handle the uh, it can handle the elements, and you usually varnish it though. That's what gives it its protection. And uh, use a varnish that has a different medium than what you painted with. That way, um, they can completely take off the varnish with a varnish solvent, but not e not uh, disturb any of the paint. So that's why you shouldn't varnish it with the medium that you painted with. Okay, that's starting to come along. I like the addition of the yellow ochre. I think yellow ochre is one of those colors that just improves everything. You can see I'm getting a broken line because this brush is softer than what I had before. So that's a little mistake, but that's all right because I'm going to show you how to fix it. I'm going to turn it so my edge away from my brush is um, is away from it, I guess. And I'm going to go in with my light color, and I am just going to wiggle against it. And that's going to sharpen that line back up again. So I would probably add a little extra petal, kind of fold, fold it over in this, um, on this bud to help explain why it's so thick now. So I'm grabbing a little bit of crimson, a little bit of ultramarine. And I'll just throw in like a, a suggestion of another little petal fold there. Okay, so now I want to work on the little hip there. Um, I think that I will just grab a smaller black swan. I think you'll probably use a round one. Now the rounds are not as useful. So if you are buying like um, piece by piece for your oil painting brushes, the, the rounds are not going to be as useful for pushing paint around. Uh, you might want a couple small rounds for signing your name or doing tiny details, but because they're more, a more flexible brush, they just can't push the, uh, the paint around very well. But if you're going on top of something that already has paint um, and you're just kind of like pulling out a few highlights, it's going to work fine. That's what we're going to do here. I'm going to add a little bit of water to my brush just to get the bristles pointed. And I'm going to take yellow because that's what I need the most of. And I'm just going to mix it in with this yellow green mix I already have here, which is just, uh, I think that was yellow ochre, lemon yellow, and phthalo. And I'm going to start with that because I think that might be light enough. And I am going to um, just make the little bitty hip under here. And I'm going to need some white or something in there because it is just disappearing on me. So I'm just going to go right in with some white. There we go. You can see how white is such a powerful color. It just cuts through every other color, it seems like. I'm going to add a little more green to that to help brighten it up. And now I'm going to take the same brush because um, it's great for detail. I'm going to grab some yellow ochre, a little bit of that primary lemon yellow. And when you load up your brush, give it a little twist in the paint, and that will help you get a nice point on it. And I'm going to give this a nice, interesting edge, and I want to have like almost like a little notch in there. And I can go and blend out the bottom half of that. Back in a little bit of that yellow ochre, accentuate that little notch. I think that looks kind of cool. Maybe add a smidgen of white to it to help it have a little more opacity. You'll notice that like oil paints are generally transparent. Their medium is uh, linseed oil, which is a translucent medium. So your more opaque colors are going to take over when you start painting. So your yellows or your whites, um, because they have so much opacity, they just dominate whatever else you're trying to paint. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're choosing colors. <clears throat> 
I am, and if, if I was using a uh, regular oils, I'd probably just wipe my brush in between. I wouldn't rinse it in turpentine every time. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind if you're at home painting with tra traditional oils. I want to use a little bit of burnt umber to uh, make the edge of this a little bit crisper, the bottom edge of this petal. And then I'm gently just going back and forth on, along the edge on the inside of the, the uh, leaf just to kind of blend that color up. Okay, and then if you feel like you want some more, um, maybe more like thicker strokes on the branches, you can go ahead and do that now too. Try using the burnt umber on the bottom part of, or, or on the side opposite of where you put the green on the branches, just to help it have a little bit of roundness. I would do short, dabby, choppy strokes on the branch. That's just going to give it a kind of a barky look. Hearing a lot of typing over there. Are you guys busy in the chat? Oh yeah. Well, um, Paul Adams is saying that it's uh, at his school. It's baby. You know, they make the kids take care of the babies. You know, like the lot, like the plastic babies that are oh, alive. Oh yeah, yeah. And apparently, there's just crying babies. And I was saying that uh, my niece Eleanor apparently received one of those creepy, realistic-looking babies. And those I don't like them. <laughs> they, they give me. Ugh. Isn't the baby alive? So gross. It's weird and creepy, and I don't like them. And I'm hoping Eleanor does not bring it to my house. Is it the baby alive or the baby Bjorn? I don't know. Or? I don't know which one it is. But Lindsay was saying that she was. Uh, Michaela was saying that she received this Eleanor, and I was like, Oh God, please don't let her bring it to my house. <laughs> <laughs> <Those things. laughs> like a Chucky doll or something. Ugh. I just they're. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> I do like this little round brush though. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make some nice spring green to do some um, of the little buds. So I've just got the pretty much the primary yellow, a little bit of the phthalo green. It's super vibrant. It's almost like acidy looking, but looking at it on a white plate is a lot different than looking at it on your canvas. So just kind of dab it over and see how bright it is when you have it on your canvas because um you have to kind of it's great to mix on white because you have a nice neutral um thing to tell it apart you know you can really tell the color but then you have to usually adjust a little bit when you get to your canvas my um my wooden palettes are you know so stained from so many layers of paint that i've scrubbed off of them so it's a beautiful gray and that's actually really nice to mix on too so if you ever found a gray ceramic plate that would be another good option So I am putting a few of these really like acidy green buds, but I am going to go in and uh, tone them down. I'm going to grab some burnt umber. Same brush, not cleaning it, just picking it up. And just kind of tracing the bottom of each of those buds. I recommend though when you're done painting that you um, clean your palette because once that dries, it is difficult to remove. And I know of some oil painters that freeze their paint. They'll stick their palette in the freezer to keep it fresh for the next time. Um, I kind of worry that it might hmm. damage like its bonding ability. Like it might break down in structure. I'm not sure or not, but I do know an awful lot of painters that do that. Uh, Teresa Gonzalez, can you use the same brushes on water soluble oils and oils? Yes, I do. I do keep all my oils together though. I don't use my uh, oil brushes for acrylics um, and I don't use my acrylics for oils. I, and I don't use my watercolor for anything other than watercolor. But you could use like your acrylic brushes for watercolor without harming them, but acrylic paint could harm your watercolor brushes. So just kind of keep that in mind. And now I'm just using plain white and I'm gonna put some highlights on these buds because that white's gonna mix with what we have underneath. So if you notice my white mixing dabs here, um, notice I'm using one 
dab of white for mixing my warm colors, like my pinks and yellows, and I'm using the other one for my more cooler colors, such as green. Um, it just kind of keeps them a little, keeps my white a little fresher longer. By not cleaning my brush all the time, I'm getting a little uh, cross pollination between the colors, and it I think it makes it look a lot more natural. And that's a good tip for acrylic painters too, because sometimes acrylics can be a little, um, a little harsh with their coloring, so that will help um, kind of cross pollinate them as well. There's some little dabs of yellow and yellow ochre in there. I love how you can see the brush strokes. You can blend more though if you don't want to see them. Now a little paint goes a long way, you'll notice. Um, and I think it probably a lot of it is because it doesn't dry on you while you're working. So if you're used to painting with acrylics, don't squirt out as much paint as you would be accustomed to with acrylics because it'll end up going to waste. We'll lighten up this little petal here. A little bit of white and primary lemon yellow. I want to lighten up this area a little bit more as well. I still feel like I want that a little bit later. All right, I'm going to work on the leaves a little bit. We'll come back to our flower at the end. I kind of just like to let the paint sit a little bit and think about it before I go to any real intense details on the focal point. So that's why I'm kind of avoiding that for now. Um, so I think I'm going to switch to a flat for our leaves. I try to match my brush a lot of times with the shape of what I'm trying to paint. And um, I am going to start off with a few shadows. I'm going to take my ultramarine blue and my thalo. And then they, they lower the intens intensity of each other really well because um, ultramarine blue has red undertones and green and red are opposite. So by making a shadow with those two colors, I get a nice cool deep blue, uh, bluish green color. And that, um, that's pretty helpful. So I'm just going to put in a few lines. It's kind of like I'm painting around the veins. So I'm just, I hope, yeah, that shows up. I think you get, I'll tip it. So maybe that will one, two, three, four little shadow marks there. I'm going to do the same thing here, but I'm going to turn it so that I can reach at it at a good angle. That's another good thing about doing your background in acrylics because I can handle my canvas. If, if this was all oils, it would be wet and I'd be getting paint all over the place. I'd probably be covered in paint and I'm sitting slightly behind you. You probably would be, yeah. <laughs> and Chewy would be too because she'd find a way to walk around and get paint on her. <laughs> she'd be painting the canvas with her tail. She, like, whenever I've painted, like, helped friends paint or painted walls at my house inevitably she gets paint on her by like hitting the wall or smushing up against it and her tail hits it and she has paint all through her tail i have no way to really get to the side of the flower without getting off camera but i'll try There, so I've got some shadows in there. That's about all I really want to do. Maybe a little bit up here too. Drag some of that interior shadow down. Um, I just love how easy it is to blend with oils. I think that's probably what, because I painted with oils before acrylics, so I think that's why acrylics never really took with me, because I always felt like I was trying to fight with them. So now I'm going to make a highlight for the leaves. Um, I just wiped my brush. I didn't clean it. I'm going to take a little yellow ochre. And you can see there's still a lot of that color on my brush. And I'm gonna grab some white. It's kind of liberating to use white after it, because like in watercolors, I hardly ever use white. Um, so to use white so freely, it's almost like using white like I do water. It's kind of fun and uh, and freeing. And I'm gonna pull some of these highlights. 
down from the edge of the um, leaves. Can edge it with yellow ochre too. It gives it a, gives it a really pretty, little pretty edge. Remember to turn your canvas so that you're comfortable painting. Uh, Diane Murray, it looks like you can paint layers with this oil, and it doesn't smear when adding more colors. Why is that? Um, it's really no different than, than regular oils. I've switched to a softer brush as I'm going, so it's not going to disturb what's underneath as much as like if I was going in with one of these um, like hog bristle brushes. So I'm just I'm switching to a softer, a softer brush. But yeah, I would say working properties, it's if you don't like oils, you're not going to like water mixable oils because the working properties are just about the same. Uh, Lynn McLean, how do you find working with the water mixable oils versus regular oils and also versus the Geneva paint? Which do you prefer? Um, for cleanup, I prefer the water mixables. Um, actually, I really like these water mixables. I've had some other ones that are just seem a little bit like the lacking in body, like the um, like the Winsor Newton Artisan for whatever reason in the Reeves. I find them, they're they're fine, they're good paints, but I find them to lack body a little bit. These don't seem to be lacking in body, um, but I usually typically prefer a traditional oil with real oil in it just because it, it has a richer look, but this, this one, these look pretty rich. So, you know, I, I really don't think I have that much of a preference. I like the smell of real, real oils because I like that oily smell. This is a little bit of the oily smell, but not as much as like um, like a regular oil. Like linseed oil has this beautiful smell to it. Uh, Brittany Niver, Niver, what are your favorite oil brushes and acrylic brushes? Um, I like a couple different oil brushes. I like these black swans, and I also like Winton by uh, Winsor and Newton, and that's their actually student grade line. Um, but I really like uh, both of those. They're not neither of them are are very expensive. Well, I mean, this was kind of expensive, but I've had it for like twenty years, so it was twelve dollars and twenty cents. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's that's less than a dollar a year. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't know sixty cents a year or something. So. Um, those are probably the two that I would recommend that not knowing everything about oil brushes and know a lot more about watercolor brushes. They can use um, like regular synthetic brushes. This is a uh, fusion. I like the Royal fusion line as well with, um, with oils. I'm going to make some more shadow color to go in here. I'm actually going to mix a gray and I am going to grab some ultramarine and I do have a little red on my brush. I'm going to grab a little burnt umber. I'm going to mix them together. I just have to make sure I don't get too much of the burnt umber because it could get kind of brown, too brown in there. I definitely want it more of a gray. And I'm going to go in and put in some of my deepest shadows on the flower. You can see how that, that's so dark that it does tend to cut through my white. And I think even though it hasn't sat very long, just giving it a little time for the paint to kind of set and set up a little bit helps your shadows stick. So if you feel, if you're painting and you feel like you just can't get the shadows in that you want, let it sit for a bit and come back to it. Sometimes it just needs a little bit of time to set up a little bit. It doesn't seem like it would have had enough time just in like the half an hour or so since when we started filling in the flower, but apparently that's all it really needed. Uh, Gina Harbert, do you have to clean these brushes with mineral spirits after painting with the water-soluble oils? Nope, that's the big benefit of the water-soluble is clean up. You clean it with a, well, I'm rinsing in water as I go, but then when I'm done, um, you can use whatever soap you like to clean your brushes with. I prefer the Masters brush cleaner. It's in it's a little cake. Um, it comes in a little plastic uh, tub, and that's my favorite brush soap. I like it because if it gets kind of wet and mucky from painting, it's enclosed in its own little tub, so it's not like sitting nasty on your, you know, sink waiting to dry out. 
Uh, Ian Jackson, have you used Alkid oil paints and do they compare to the water soluble oils? Oh, you know, A-L-K-Y-D. Alkid, they dry faster than, um, than, than your oils, but they're very, um, they're, they're, they're nice. They're quicker to dry, but you still get the working properties of oils, but you don't have to wait so long. And I think you can mix them with oils. So if you're, you know, just trying a couple tubes, I think you can mix. Joey. Too quiet. You're too, too quiet out there all by yourself. I don't trust you. So if I put some like subtle shadows over the white areas, they are mixing in and just getting very soft and natural looking. And having our shadows have a little bit of a purple cast because we have a little crimson and blue in there too. It uh, keeps it from getting too muddy. And I'm looking at the reference photo. It was the first one I listed for most of the detail on this flower. If you're trying to figure out which flower I'm doing, it's the single one that's in that first reference photo. Northern Birder, is it possible to paint over water-soluble oils when dry with regular oil paint? Yep. Yep, the only difference between water-mixable and traditional oils is the water-based cleanup. They're both oil paints, so um, you can treat them just like you would um, regular oils. Now I'm using this, I'm just picking up whatever little filbert I have handy that's clean and dry, and I'm just going over and blending my shadows, starting with my lightest areas. Remember to get in there and, you know, have your brush facing the edge that you want to preserve so that you don't end up with a fuzzy edge where you need a crisp one. So I just finished recording um, my first watercolor course. Oh, how did that go? Very good. I hope to launch it before Mother's Day. Yay. Yes. Yes. I've been, it's been keeping me very busy. So that's why I haven't had any extra uh, painting tutorials out this week. Just been the few card making ones because I was so busy working on that. But I think it's going to be um, really useful. Sometimes it can be really hard to determine um, where you need shadows when your painting is wet because it will you'll get you'll be painting your shadows they they tend to be a little oilier and more transparent and they catch the light and they glare so you'll be it can look like you don't have very many shadows there because it's just reflecting you know the light in your surroundings so you might even want to let it sit for a bit a day or so and let it dry before you determine whether you need a lot more shading because. Chances are you have enough, but it's just so wet that you can't, it's, it's reflecting light and looking lighter instead of looking shadowed. So I'm still just blending. That's all I'm really doing here. Uh, Alexandra Manga, is the new watercolor painting class going to be on YouTube? No, it's going to be on Teachable, actually. I've just, uh, um, well, I haven't really opened it yet, but I've I've started a teachable school. It's still private because I haven't have my own my class up there yet. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's a lot of footage. I think I've got about eight hours. Oh uh, lord! Yeah, three full full real time painting tutorials, and I also go through all the techniques on their own and materials on their own, and um, then how to apply everything. So it's pretty in depth. I, I don't think it would do well on YouTube. I think I think it's too much. It's mm -hmm. too long. People would watch it, and my channel would get dinged. So. <laughs> And Joy Hawkins would like to know when it will be up and available. Um, I'm hoping by um, next Friday, if, if things go 
according to plan. But if you um, if you sign up for my my blog or my mailing list. Um, in the video description, it says sign up for my newsletter. If you sign up for that, you'll get first notification when it goes live. And Carrie Cuddlepuss would like to know how much the class will be. I haven't fully determined that yet. Um, cause I still have to go through and edit all the footage. So um, I'll go through and, um, and edit it and then determine. But I will do a, um, like a sale when I first launch it. So, so people should... Go to your page, sign up. Yeah. You'll get all the information as the class becomes available, when they can sign up, how much, right, et cetera, right, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you follow Lindsay on her blog, on her YouTube channel, and on Facebook, because then you'll have all the information you need about her upcoming upcoming tutorials. Yeah. Woo! Yeah, I want to make sure people get their money's worth, so that's why I haven't decided on a price until I've actually gone through and edited everything and um, and what have you. That's tough. It's like pricing your work, you know, like when you're doing a yeah. show or craft fair, you have to price your work, and it's such a yeah, you know, you, it's awful. <laughs> I need to, like an independent person to price my class for me. That's what I'll probably do. I'll probably contact my other art teacher friends and be like, "What do you think, honestly?" Uh, Jennifer Russell, are you going to sell this painting? Uh, yeah, if anybody wants to buy it. I'm assuming she does if she's asking. Oh. <laughs> she didn't say, but I'm assuming. Yeah, uh, this size, because it has to be shipped in a box, um, would be 75 with U.S. shipping included. <clears throat> now I'm going to redo this little shadow here. I feel like it's way too, too light. There. So your shadows basically are separating your um, your petals. You can see a little glare from my, my collage gave it some interesting texture underneath the mulberry paper collage. I also want to do the same thing with highlights. I want to go in and add some brighter highlights. And again, I want to do that with a nice soft brush. I like the filberts, but I don't know if I have a clean, dry one that's small enough. So I think I'll probably have to use a flat. But um, I really think with oil painting, your filberts are your most useful brushes. I don't know. I love the name Filbert. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't like the nuts, but I like the name Filbert. You don't. You only. I like. I like Filberts because they're hazelnuts. So that's my favorite kind of coffee. I like them in like the baked good, like a homemade baked oh, yeah. good. But like to yeah. just sit and eat a hazelnut, not. I'm an almond, cashew, pistachio nut eater. Yeah. The only time I ever have hazelnuts is, is like Christmas when they have like the little assortments. Do you buy, you know, the bag of nuts, the, mm. the decorative nuts that you put the out? decorative <laughs> nuts that nobody's actually allowed to eat. Uh, Elizabeth Marie, what do you think about laminating watercolor swatches? Do you think it would ruin the trueness of the colors? Uh, you know, I think that's actually a pretty good idea because whenever I'm like, I've got my swatches because I like swatch out each palette. Uh, so I remember what everything is and you get them splashed and stuff like that. I think it's a great way to, to, to preserve it. That's a good, I just actually, I got some clear, um, some, just some clear cello bags. That's what I use. I slide my swatches in there and stick it in my palette. So I have them with me for whatever palette I'm using. I could take it out of the sleeve. So that's an idea because you could take it out of the baggie if you don't need it. You know, if you use like a little cello bag. And it's up to you, like on these highlights, if you want to leave the brush strokes in or you want to blend them out. Magnolia flowers have such thick, smooth petals. I like to capture that smoothness, but I also like the look of a brush stroke now and then. And my highlight does have a little bit of yellow ochre in it. It's not just pure white. If you prefer a cooler toned flower, you could have a little smidgen of ultramarine in it. 
just use a color you've already used so that you don't end up with um, discordant highlights. Down here, I should have a much brighter highlight on the edge of that. Uh, Gracie Shack, can you paint with oil pastels if they are water soluble? Yep, and you can paint with regular oil pastels too. You just need to add, um, you just use linseed oil uh, or turpentine to dissolve them. A lot of times I do my sketches with um, oil pastels. Now I need a real sharp, crisp white highlight. Oh, and when you're loading your brush, um, it's important that you keep your paint at the tip of your brush or like halfway up the bristles. It keeps you from getting paint into the metal ferrule, which where it can dry and splay the bristles apart. But a lot of times I just tap, tap, tap to load it because I just want that paint on the tip. If it gets back here, it's not going on my canvas. It's wasted. I want it up at the top where it's going to seal my bristles together and, um, and be where I can use it, where it will come off. There. So just make sure those overturned petals have a nice slice of highlight on them. And these would be like kind of the final highlights that were kind of like the icing on the cake. Or the sprinkles on the cake, or the cupcake. Or the piece de resistance. Piece de resistance. All right, so now I'm going to evaluate here and see what I think I might need. I'm going to put a little bit more. I don't think I really did too many highlights on that. Um, I feel like I want a little more red in that petal, so I'm just going to go in with one of my small rounds. And grab some of that red. I'm going to add a smidgen of the ultramarine because that's what we've done for all the the pinkish colors. Has had a little bit of the ultramarine in it. And I'm going to use it on a clean brush with no white because I want to make sure it's going to stand out. And even though in the reference photo this petal is very white, I don't. I, I feel like it doesn't really match the um, the painting very well. So I am going to darken it. And I also see that I have a vein going up the center of that flower. So I want to kind of get that in. And I'm going to turn my paint, my canvas, so that I'm comfortable in the way that I'm going to approach it. And you can see just that paint wants to glide because we've got that wet um, surface underneath. And it keeps us from also getting too fussy because the uh, the white paint's going to overtake it a little bit, so we don't have to worry so much about overdoing it. And that's why I like oils so much; it's such a natural way to paint. Maybe do a little bit of that veining work in some of these side petals as well. If your paint's dragging too much, you can add a little bit of water because we are painting all in one, all at once. If you're doing this like a, a week later, uh, you'd want to add a little oil to it though because your bottom layers would have already dried. So any place you think you want a few veins, you can go ahead and put those in. Just make sure you use whatever the uh, color you started with when we started fleshing in the flower. I'm surprised there's not many questions today. Are the mods oh, just on the ball? They are. Um, I think a lot of people are confused. They keep asking watercolor and other types of questions. Oh. And we're trying. We're just reminding people we're sticking with the water soluble oil and oil paint questions. Oh today. yeah. I'll do a watercolor next week though. So. You'll be back to regularly scheduled programming. Yeah. 
yeah, I feel like doing something different. I'm doing the, working on that course all week. I've, I've kind of been like, oh, I think I want to try something different. I'm doing a lot of watercolor. Uh, Diane Murray, how long will it take for this painting to dry and where do you put it for drying? Um, often I'll just stick a tack on the wall and, and uh, hang it up or leave it on my easel downstairs. If you put like a wire, like eye hooks and a wire on the back of your painting before you begin, you can, um, you can just like hang it on a hook on the wall to let it dry. Just make sure it's someplace away from a lot of dust. Cat hair, dog yeah. hair. Yeah, it'll be dry to the touch in about a week. Um, maybe even sooner. It kind of depends on where you live and whatnot. So what I'm looking for now is just a soft... Um, I don't have any more soft, small black swan brushes. I'm just going to take a soft brush and some of these veins that are a little bit further. Like I really like the veins on this, this, and that. But these ones in back I want to soften a little bit. So I'm just going to mop over them with this um, very soft brush. Uh, Taylor Young, what are your top tips for beginning oil painters? I have absolutely no oil painting experience. Um, I would say uh, if you've never started and you don't have any, I would try water mixable because it just takes out that variable of cleaning. It's a lot easier to clean. Um, I would get some oil pastels and I would play with sketching with those and then um, adding... Um, like mineral spirits or if they're water soluble oils you can add water like try those for your underpaintings just to kind of get used to it um and i would i would say don't put out too much paint at once because you know it'll go to waste you don't go through that much um i guess those that would be pretty much it for my tips it's a pretty um easy easy medium to learn i think you're eating something edible chewy uh i bet miller I paint in my basement. Is oil paint stinky? I don't think it is. It's usually the solvents that smell, not the paint. I like the smell of oil paint. It's got a very, I don't know, I think it's like a nice fragrant, warm smell. I, I can't smell your paints from here. I'm about two feet behind you. Okay. And I can't, I mean, my, I'm not stuffy or anything, and I can't smell anything. So if it is, it's a very small, it's not a very strong smell. Yeah, it's almost like a, like a beeswax smell that they have, like... Uh, it's very faint, but solvents can be stinky. So um, I like Gamzol. It has absolutely no odor, but I kind of am a little worried because it has no odor that I don't want it. I don't want to be breathing in stuff that I'm not aware I'm breathing in. Mm, so fun. you can make some interesting oil, <laughs> well, oil paintings. <laughs> well, I have kids and pets here, so I don't want to have the chemicals float around. Oh, that's true. Um, so with the water mixables, you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, it's usually the solvents that are stinky there. Um, and then something else I like to do is I'll take uh, that red and take a little burnt umber uh, because red gives a really nice pop against green. So if I have a little bit of red in here, I can go in and get like put some speckles on some of these leaves. Kind of it's almost like giving, giving the, those leaves that sometimes you get like a little bit of rustiness to them. So I like to go in and dab some of that in there. Take a little bit of the perfection off. It's more interesting if it's not perfect. Uh, Maggi Mora, what is another color you can use instead of ultramarine blue? Uh, cobalt. I find cobalt not to be quite as strong as ultramarine. I think it might be a little more opaque too. And I'm just uh, adding a little more burnt umber to the inside pocket of that leaf underneath the main magnolia because I feel like it's, uh, I need to make that little, the hip of the flower stand out a little bit more. There. I think I just splashed my painting, but I don't see any drops on there, so maybe I didn't. Just seeing if I flipped water on anything. Maybe not. All right. So let's see. Maybe just a little highlight on the leaf. 
right here. And I think I might just add a little smidgen of color on some of these buds, just a little bit of the, uh, the pinkish color. Liven them up a little bit. So playing with opposites is another way that you can make your uh, painting a little more lively. So if you see you've got some green there hanging out that's not really doing anything, it doesn't look very uh, enticing, add a little smidgen of pink or red next to it. Same thing with the, with the red. You can kind of accent it with a little bit of green. Purple can be accented with yellow. Just a little brush stroke. It just makes a little bit of a difference. I think I might want to put just a little bit of green onto that bud because they do have a little bit of a green tinge. Not a ton, though. I'm just picking up something I've already used on my palette. And I think I'm just going to give it a little bit. Oops, I blot some of that off. That's quite a bit. Okay, maybe even put a little bit on the edge there. Maybe over here where I had an issue with it not showing up very well. Now, I notice I have a little spot right there. I'm going to see if I can. I was going to have my branch go right across the paper or across the paper. So I'm going to see if I can remove that white, that white line. And if I can't, then I am going to continue the branch across. Oh, it's coming right up. Okay, that's good. Q-tip would have been better for that, but... There we go. All right. I think I'm going to call this done. What do you think, Sarah? Does that look done to you? I think so. I think if you start messing with it, you'll start overworking it. Yeah, probably so. That tends to be what I, what I do. I do the same thing. Well, there you have it. So to clean my palette, what I'm going to do is I'll just spray it with water and I will wipe it off and uh, throw away the rags. Um, I would be careful with the, with the, the paint just it doesn't have solvent in it so it should be fine but most paints are most oil paints are flammable or the solvents are anyway so um it's a good idea if you can like clean it up and then put it out in the trash on trash day uh, as opposed to just kind of cleaning it up and you know sitting next to the stove i don't know just be careful with it because it is uh, it is an oil paint do we have any final questions before we go uh, we do okay. uh best dot four six nine do you happen to know what the old masters used before linseed oil if so have you tried whatever it is yourself they used egg tempera and i haven't tried it because i pretty much know it wouldn't go with my personality it's a very slow, slow process of building up colors it's pigment plus fresh egg yolk and um, since it dries almost immediately, you have to put it in little cross hatching marks. So use very small brushes and just little lines of paint to build up the uh, the picture. But um, it's a very durable medium. But as soon as oil paint was invented, a lot of artists jump ship because this is so much more fun to paint with. And we had a couple of questions on how people can get a hold of you to purchase this painting. Um, you can email me at artstudiosofbangor at yahoo.com and first come first serve is, the, is what I do. First person that sends me an email and pays for it, gets it. And it would probably be a couple weeks before I can ship it out just because it won't be completely dry and safe for shipping. So, um, so just keep that in mind. If you're getting this for a Mother's Day gift for somebody, I don't think it'd be dry and ready to ship out in that amount of time. <gasps> Oh, thank you very much for what was that it for questions? That was it. Yep. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you so much for watching, guys. Um, if you need any of the supplies that I use, they're linked in the video description. Check out our sponsor, jerrysartorama.com. There's a coupon code. And the really cool thing about the coupon code, not only does it save you 20%, but it also lets them know that I sent you. And um, it helps them, you know, determine whether it's worth it for them to sponsor my videos, which is uh, which is part of the reason I'm able to put them up here for free every week. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And until next time, happy crafting.